This is our second North American contribution to the International Dialogue Project on the History of Ideas and their Practical Applications. We have found from our discussion so far that it is useful to focus on periods of change in order to get insight into what was the unique character of particular places. So we have chosen the 1950s because that was a moment of change, not only in North American geography, but in other schools as well. The repercussions came later in some schools, but it was here that I think uh, the change was felt with perhaps greater drama than elsewhere. This discussion will be chaired by Professor George Kish at the University of Michigan. The panelists are Professor William D. Patterson, University of Chicago, Duane Noss, Clark University, Fred Lukerman, University of Minnesota, and Richard Morrill, University of Washington, Seattle. Each of these individuals has lived through that period and can give us insight from his own experience on the question of change and the environment of graduate school during the period of change. Our topic is American geography in universities in the 1950s. It was a time of change, a time of growth, a time when the atmosphere within each of the major centers of American geography, in terms of staff, students, thrust, was undergoing a change. All of us around this table were involved with it. At Chicago, the University of Minnesota, University of Iowa, University of Washington, and at the University of Michigan. Our uh, main purpose here is to discuss some aspects of that change as it affected the directions in which geography was moving, the programs, and the personnel. And what I'd like to suggest in our opening segment is to look upon each of the departments with which we were associated at that time and to see how we look back some 20 odd years later upon those times in which we participated and which in many ways were the formative years of what American geography is at the present time. And I'd like to uh, start with Dr. Patterson, who at that time was at the University of Chicago, as he is now. Dr. Patterson. Well, George, I have some difficulty, I'm sure, as we all do, in remembering quite that far back. However, um, as I was reflecting earlier today, I found myself adopting what might be called a, a position of faculty determinism. That is, I found myself believing or uh, granting my own belief that um, uh, who was on the faculty at what time was indeed of decisive uh, difference. And therefore, partially as a remedy to memory, I brought along the department uh, list of faculty, uh, which perhaps I could consult at this time, uh, with the uh, following roster then emerging. Um, when I joined the department, which was in January of 1950, as uh, a well-intending, I think, a graduate of uh, Hutchins College, um, I found the following persons uh, on hand in creating, uh, I'd say now, a rather special atmosphere, one that was to be dispelled only a few years later. Here they were. First, Robert Plant who was uh, chairman, and newly so, as of that time. Henry Lepard and Edith Parker were very shortly to be leaving. Uh, Chauncey Harris, uh, representing uh, a presence that had begun somewhat earlier, that is 1943. And then the following, all of whom were new, Wesley Califf, Norton Ginsburg, Harold Mayer, Alan Philbrick, Looking back, I'd suggest that uh, there was a pervasive feeling of a new geography, interestingly enough, at Chicago, specifically, uh, as of 1950. Um, this impression was uh, augmented by the additional presence of Edward Ackerman, who had a critical significance, I think, that uh, perhaps even in the brief time provided, I'll be able to develop. Robert Platt, I believe, as I look back, intended to create a, a school of thought as of that time. He was, in fact, uh, superintending a faculty with a remarkable, uh, constituting a remarkable continuation, social continuation and intellectual continuation, 
Uh, Norton Ginsburg was a graduate of the department. Harold Mayer was. Colin Felbrick was. Wesley Califf was. Chauncey Harris was. And uh, the soon to depart uh, Henry Lepard and Edith Parker were. Um, there was then, as uh, one of three general attributes at that time, an intellectual cont continuity that was quite striking. Second, there was the exercise of personal leadership, um, and there's no question about that on Platt's part. And third, there was intellectual isolation. Uh, there were great dangers in this. Uh, I have learned since then, largely by courtesy of Marvin Mikesell, that in fact uh, the dissolution or phasing out of the department was seriously considered at that time by the University of Chicago. And I would say now that uh, very possibly this was because of the observed intellectual isolation and its consequences. Uh, I have in mind when I say that, isolation from other fields of knowledge. If there was yet another uh, general characterizing attribute, George, it would be this. That is <laughs> that although there were uh, younger people uh, now available for carrying on the Chicago tradition, as Robert Platt saw it, in a somewhat different and promising way. Nonetheless, I wonder if they weren't, in the last analysis, stymied, baffled as to exactly where they should go and how, sh how they should get there to the extent they had a, a notion of, uh, of destination. The break came without any question. I think any number of interpreters had come to the same conclusion with the advent of new faculty, most importantly, Philip Wagner in 1956 and um, Gilbert White. Uh, if I may correct myself, Phil Wagner in 55, Gil White came in in 56. Very shortly afterward, and largely at the instance of White, Brian Berry in 1958 and Marvin Mikesell in the same year. I'd venture this that thereupon, with the advent of that group, the intellectual isolation of the department was broken. There was very widespread intellectual resorting and uh, reconsideration. If I could uh, take the liberty, I brought along Harold Mayer's article on Chicago, from which I'd like to select the sing this uh, sentence or two. He says that when Gilbert White was asked what he envisioned as a future program for the department at that time, he said, the program of the department should be the sum of the programs of the individual members of the department. Uh, he broke the resolve to compose a single school of thought. He um, uh, under his aegis, I would say a gentleman's agreement um, was struck. And indeed, the future of Chicago then, for at least two decades, uh, arose from this conception of many departments within one. Second, uh, there was a, a renewal of the personal leadership principle, that's evident, uh, in the place of Platt, a white, with his quite different ideas. Third, <clears throat> there was the encouragement of intellectual exchange and exposure in striking contrast to the practice, if not exactly the policy, that had prevailed in the earlier years. All of this is to say that, uh, to my way of thinking, looking back, there was a distinct phasing within the decade concerned of the two phases. It's the earlier one that's very real to me because I was there. The second, I know by inheritance, having come back to Chicago in the next decade, by the report of particularly Marvin Mikesell. Now, do I have a few moments remaining? Or Here we I... come back, because All we'll right. be going around the table. It's been said, and this conference brought it up again, that the Midwest is the heartland of American geography. It's also been said American geography is within 500 miles of Chicago. Apologies to Seattle. And maybe we will move on, and I'll turn to our colleague, Dr. Nose, who at that time was at the University of Iowa. Yeah, I started work at the University of Iowa uh, in summer school. I was a school teacher, uh, and it was disillusioned with painting houses in the summertime. And uh, that was in the summer of 1949. 
and it was about three years after the department had been established in the College of Liberal Arts. That fact that it did, uh, it was a new department uh, is interesting, I think, in terms of what subsequently becomes uh, uh, an experience of a lot of innovation uh, in that department, of which uh, uh, I had, uh, uh, that was the conditions under which I was socialized into this geography community in a very real sense. That department centered around uh, Harold McCarty. And Harold McCarty uh, was the uh, first chairman of the department. He had uh, gotten his degree at Iowa when uh, geography and sociology and economics were all together in the, in the College of Commerce, as I understand it. Uh, there were a number of compadres of his age, uh, a couple of economists, Woody Thompson and uh, Clark Bloom, a sociologist named Harold Saunders, a social psychologist, Manfred Kuhn, uh, who were sort of the young Turks in the development of, uh, of the College of, in the College of Commerce on the faculty. And when they uh, split the sociology department and the geography department out of the College of Commerce into the College of Liberal Arts and made them separate departments. That association was maintained, uh, probably a more intimate uh, association than you normally see across disciplinary lines. They were all friends and uh, talked to each other, had the same uh, metaphors and the same language, and uh, when I came in as a graduate student, I found myself suddenly not just with, grad with geography students and with geographers, but with economists and sociologists as well. That's, uh, that's one uh, sort of an aspect that I think uh, was, was important in the kinds of, kinds of work that the people at Iowa did in the, in the middle 50s. Another... Uh, of uh, happening had to do with the town of West Branch, about 20 miles east of Iowa City, which was a Quaker community, and in which uh, the uh, friends uh, brought displaced Jewish scholars from Europe, essentially, for uh, uh, as a as a sort of a center, and a number of those. Those scholars ended up at the University of Iowa during the war period. Among them, Kurt Schaefer and uh, Gustav Bergman. Schaefer and Bergman were good friends. And I mentioned Bergman uh, largely because he was a member of the original Vienna Circle and uh, probably the premier philosopher of logical positivism. And uh, Schaefer was incorporated in the geography department, uh, Bergman into the psychology department, but he had a tendency to integrate himself with the geographers and sociologists and economists and uh, with, a, with a thrust in the philosophical problems of the social sciences, primarily. Uh, the third element, I think, is McCarty himself and, uh, and the rest of the faculty. I uh, mentioned Kurt Schaefer, but uh, also uh, George Hartman and, and Walt Wood, uh, who uh, were rather remarkable people, particularly in terms of the, of the intellectual community that they formed. They had offices on the third floor of the library at the West End and uh, uh, went to coffee together, along with whatever number of graduate students who wanted to go, every morning at 10 o'clock time-honored geographical pastime. Yes. And uh, also on the <clears throat> third floor of the library were the philosophers, and they used to go to coffee at the same time. And I look back with great fondness that continual half hour to an hour of general discussion where I think I really learned <laughs> most of what I learned. It was within this context that... Uh, that uh, uh, the experiments with, with statistics particularly uh, took place. 
Uh, one of the mentors of McCarty was a, was a statistician named George Davies in business statistics and another friend, C. Frank Smith. And so uh, that whole group were not unfamiliar with statistical analysis and that sort of a thing, didn't do much of it, but uh, was familiar with it and had the resources to pursue it. But the effect of Bergman on that community was, uh, was, was important. Uh, the metaphor was statistical analysis, uh, regression models and that sort of a thing. But I would suggest that the thing that, that the Iowa people were really dealing with was positivism and a, and a view of, of uh, science in those terms, of which statistics was just a very handy metaphor to play that, that type of philosophy out. And uh, in that uh, uh, rather incredible ferment, in which you had not only uh, geography, but also uh, psychology, uh, philosophy, uh, sociology, and economics uh, with, a, with a philosophical commonality. Uh, I think that that's where most of the innovation that Iowa came from and then was carried on. One of the um, features that in our earlier discussion this morning we agreed upon was the expansion of geography in one of the departments where that expansion was very much in evidence was Minnesota. So on our turn to Fred Lokerman. I think that's true. But I think what you said about uh, the 50s being a period of transition is the most important. And the most important thing about that, I think, was that we all realized it was a transition. It's not something we look back on and say, aha, that was a period of transition. At Minnesota, we were very conscious of that. And I suppose I was as much as anybody since uh, I walked into Minnesota as a freshman in September of 1940, left it for the war, came back in 46, and the department was completely new. Um, Davis was about to retire. Brown had only two years left of his life. Hartshorn had gone to Madison. Weaver had come in in 46, just fresh out of uh, the AGS and the Arctic Atlas. Brooke came in in uh, 48, Borchard a year or so afterwards. So there was a complete transition between the war period and the beginning of the 50s. In the 50s, I think probably the greatest change was the enormous efflorescence of geography, both in terms of faculty and in numbers of students. If I remember right, the enrollment started climbing like 20% a year in terms of the introductory courses. And as we, as graduate students, which were few in number, suddenly had to uh, service this group we became faculty and we weren't told we had choices we taught what we wanted to teach so my memory goes back to a number of transitions it's the old department the Hartshorn Brown Dickin Davis department with its traditions and it was a tradition of research the things we used to hear about it I think we could verify by uh, our own accounts of the retired people it was said that Davis uh, locked the doors at noon in the department, kept all students away, and told the rest of them to get down to their research. <clears throat> I remember that when Davis retired, he was writing his uh, second edition of Earth and Man, and he was in the uh, back room behind the only lecture room we really owned, a cartography lab, and he used to counsel us as graduate students. Don't get married until you get your PhD, for example, and this sort of thing. He was an old uh, Yankee from Michigan, as you know, George. The next change was certainly the input. Uh, Weaver, although he was young and out of the AGS and had originally been at Madison, came out of Berkeley. Brooke, who had been at Berkeley all during the 30s, had gone back to Utrecht after the war spent a year there, came in as the new chairman. It was a, a two-man department at that time. There were a number of us graduate students teaching, 
And then Orchard, the all-American boy, came in from Wisconsin. I remember that very distinctly because it was something we really hadn't expected in terms of the old tradition and the Berkeley tradition that had been imported by Weaver and uh, Brooke. I remember the first time I heard him, he uh, reviewed his thesis on the Prairie Triangle, physical geography, climatology. And it was a new physical geography. I think one of the first things I ever heard John say was how happy he was to get away from Wisconsin and not do Finch and Trewartha anymore. That he went into a resource geography. I think the other change was a consciousness of what was happening in the national discipline. You remember that was a period of enormous interest in the outside world. The area studies programs were booming. We'd gone into the uh, Korean police action, as they called it. Uh, enormous influx of GIs and people who had delayed their education, but enormous intellectual activity. And then all the things that were changing technologically in the country. Uh, the Twin Cities, for example, had just broken out of its uh, political boundaries and started its urban sprawl. And the kind of things that Borchardt was interested in, and Weaver also, was essentially in an applied geography. I don't think they ever said that, but that's what they were doing. They were doing uh, public roads, they were doing demography, they were doing the changes in technology in the American Midwest, the Corn Belt, and so on. And then, of course, what hit us the most was uh, another wave of thought which came out of uh, Washington, which came out of Northwestern, which came out of Iowa, as Duane has said, in the late 50s. That is, it hit us in the late 50s. And we were very critical of that. We had come out with the Hartshorn Brown economic, political, historical geography of the 30s, 20s. Then we had on top of that the Berkeley tradition, the cultural historical tradition, which we welded together with Brown. And now we had this quantitative, theoretical, uh, model-building school. It was enormously exciting. I mean, you knew that things were changing, you knew that you were part of it, and we could do what we wanted to. I think that's the best memory I have, is that we were in charge. Well, we just said that <clears throat> geography is a Midwestern field, yet I think it'd be only fair to say, from what has so far emerged out of this conversation, that things were happening out on the West Coast. I think we're very fortunate to have a witness of what is happening in the extreme Northwest. Dr. Morrill. Well, it's safe to say that the uh, University of Washington had uh, no reputation uh, nationally before the 1950s. Then, rather suddenly, uh, in a meteoric rise to uh, a considerable influence in the late 50s. But uh, I think it's also true that uh, the influence came via Chicago and Northwestern from that Midwestern heartland and, and not from our rivals to the South in California, which uh, even today seem uh, many thousands of miles farther away than Chicago and Northwestern. Uh, it's interesting that none of the early group of quantitative students had any such intention when we went to Washington. I think all of us had a very traditional background. Mine was in physical geography at Dartmouth. Uh, so our conversion came after we arrived uh, from a combination of people and circumstances. On the road to Seattle? No, after we got to Seattle. The, and I think the most important influence was probably, or at least the first, was the chairman, Donald Hudson, who came from uh, Northwestern and Chicago. Um, among other things, he challenged us to uh, not accept the traditions out of the Midwest and encouraged us to question even Hartshorn, uh, encouraged us to worry about the status of geography and its uh, relatively low esteem. That had never occurred to us un until he told us. Um, he also told us that uh, geography could be practical and influential, which uh, gave us some encouragement. But I suppose the most important thing he did was to bring both Garrison and Ullman in 50 and 51 to Washington. 
uh, Ed Ullman was uh, then the second big influence on us. And he was not, of course, a statistician. Um, he never understood the slightest thing about it and didn't want to. And yet, um, it was Ullman who was the fountain of ideas, which uh, we then used statistics to test. And it was uh, really Ullman who introduced the concept of geography as a spatial science, uh, who introduced uh, Schaefer to us, um, uh, who led us into these uh, questioning of the Midwestern traditions. It's Ullman who introduced uh, models and theories to us. So his influence uh, was much greater, I think, than perhaps we realized at the time. Then, but the greatest influence, uh, at least on me, and probably on most of us, was Bill Garrison. Um, he was, in looking back, a, a kind of a charismatic, uh, prophetic leader, and I use those words because uh, I guess I'd have to confess that we almost fell into a discipleship type of relationship. Uh, uh, the message was almost a messianic one that, uh, that we needed to assault the, the citadels of uh, Midwestern tradition. And, and uh, <clears throat> we had the idea that we were going out to convert the heathen, the, the heathen right? In a way, uh, it's interesting <clears throat> to reflect now at 25 plus years distance that as it turned out, the greatest single impact since the days of uh, William Morris Davis that American geography made worldwide was precisely that message which came out of the University of Washington. Now, in my case, to put it very briefly, Michigan probably changed less in that particular 10-year period than any of the four institutions we've been talking about as a result of, in part, the natural process of attrition, which moved rather slowly, uh, our enrollment, our graduate enrollment increased greatly. We had, as uh, Fred Lukerman said, this great influx of people enthusiastic for more knowledge, enthusiastic to get a degree, enthusiastic going, thinking of the years they've lost. And it had, I think, a very direct impact and influence on the quality of our graduate group. Yet the staff did not really begin to change. And this is, again, in retrospect, until the first uh, apostle arrived from uh, Seattle. Uh, when John Ashton came to Michigan in 59, and I date from that time, the uh, rather fundamental changes that occurred in our place, yet distinctly uh, much delayed away. One of the uh, points that comes out, it seems to me, in this conversation, as we are speaking of schools and personalities, is what might, for the want of a better word, perhaps be referred to as the interconnections the cross-country the, uh, the cross influences. Uh, Dick Morrill's remark that uh, to them in Seattle, Chicago and Northwestern were much closer than the mere thousand miles down to Berkeley or uh, the city of the angels. Uh, in what way would you today, these years past, look back upon the role that these influences which were moving through, in part, the printed media, our own journals, through, in part, the movement of these new and interesting men, in part through the controversies, I'm thinking, for example, the controversies surrounding Schaefer, uh, had on the general atmosphere of American geography in the 50s. Well, we perceived ourselves out there as fairly isolated, um, difficult to get to meetings, uh, unlikely to be published very readily. Um, so I think one of the influences, uh, uh, interconnections that was important to us was the beginning of the discussion paper series in 19, uh, I guess, January 1958. And this was quite explosive and uh, became an underground circulating a series to, uh, especially to Iowa, but also to uh, the dissidents at Wisconsin and Minnesota and many places. I think it was the visitors, George. Uh, we were moving so fast that uh, we kept one line position <laughs> open for visitors. Sauer came in 1950 to dedicate the new building we were in. Oh, yes. Weibel was there. Pfeiffer was there. Olson. Olson, and uh, American geographers as well. 
And if you add on top of that the influx of new graduate students, I think the situation was fluid. I think we think too much of the historical myth of Midwestern isolationism. And we really did get out into the field. And uh, the West Lakes conferences, I think, were uh, instrumental. We'd fill a bus and go. And the interchange with other graduate students, I think, was just as important as reading the journals, reading the publications, and so on. And getting to the annual meetings, and uh, the uh, formal, and to <clears throat> me, in retrospect, much more important, informal postludes of sessions at AAG. And the AAG had just expanded in the 40s. In a sense, uh, I find it interesting that uh, when we get right down to it, one part of this whole process, this whole changing atmosphere that is our subject, may be laid squarely on the doorstep of our professional association, which after a long, long, long period of 40 years, suddenly underwent a complete sea change in 1948. As you look back on that last Wisconsin meeting in 48, after that, nothing was quite ever the same. Whether, and it's not just a matter of numbers, it's a matter of the atmosphere. The uh, greater freedom, the fact that no one, I think after that date, maybe I'm exaggerating, correct me if I'm wrong, felt excluded the way I dare say it used to be the case. That uh, sometimes it's like international conferences where the heads of delegations sit at the table and then there are rows upon rows upon rows in the background of those who really know the answers but they can only move if they are called upon. It was the senior citizens of the profession and the rest being more or less, if not excluded, but certainly not in the swim and the mainstream. And all of that, I think, changed uh, after 1948, or shall we say, beginning with the 50 meeting. And that in itself, to me, was a very important ingredient of the new atmosphere. I think yeah. there was only two or three journals also. <clears throat> Oh, you yeah. could keep up very easily, and it got you into the field. There weren't the monographs, the enormous monographs out of my original field of history. God, you couldn't uh, comprehend what was going on in that field. But in geography, you could grab it. Yes. And it was there, and you could do it yourself. And it was also an oral. That is, the network was, was uh, highly personal and highly oral. Yes. And at meetings, there weren't that many people. And you'd heard about them. Not necessarily, you, you read about them, but you also heard personal anecdotes. And there was a great deal more uh, intimacy in that. And, I, you know, and as far as Westlakes is concerned, I think that, that uh, those divisional meetings, at least for myself, I look back on those with incredible fondness because a lot of that of that paranoia we felt yes. about statistics and so on were played out in John's Roots living room at Wisconsin and uh, and those kinds of things. Uh, if I may, Joe, I think it's very welcome to have, have the additional chance to talk about the AAG and, and the regional um, meetings as well. I remember, I suppose myself most particularly, <clears throat> when I first met Ed Allman, which was at an AAG meeting, uh, 1951. Um, still in all, it uh, may be worth saying at this time that the uh, centers of production continued to be the departments. That it was, it was from the departments that uh, new ideas were issuing for interchange under the auspices of, uh, of the, uh, such organizations as West Lakes and the AAG itself. That, that is, the, it seems to me that the AAG was coming forward uh, more assertively than before in exercising its proper functions, that is, spokesmanship for all of us, for one, uh, the, uh, the setting of standards insofar as that can be done through an annals, and I think it was done, maybe overdone, <laughs> in the estimation of some, um, <clears throat> and uh, a coordination, coordination and sponsorship, but the responsibility for production, nonetheless, continued to repose in these changing departments. I'd like to go back for one moment to something that Fred Lukerman just brought up earlier, and that is the um, an interesting thing which came out in at least two of the papers at this conference, the changing perspectives of American geography, and that in the 40s and the 50s, as a result of our own history, there was a, a very great upsurge of interest in the rest of the world, and here, uh, in the case of Michigan, well, in all of our institutions. But the thing that sticks in my mind is the amount of energy that 
among geographers had suddenly been channeled into a new set of channels. Uh, and in the case of Ann Arbor, it was the Japanese studies, the Russian studies, the Southeast Asian studies. Uh, suddenly, the geographer, you were speaking earlier of intermixing and, and uh, uh, meeting on a fairly regular basis with colleagues in other fields. We did not have the good fortune of Iowa. Uh, again, part tradition, part physical setup. Our uh, interconnections within the campus came largely as a result of the uh, regional studies and, in the case of Michigan, rather early on, the urban studies, the Detroit Project, the Flint Metropolitan Project, where sociologists, psychologists, language people, literature people, political scientists, historians, uh, let me admit it, discovered there was such a thing as geography and staff, graduate students, all became increasingly involved to the extent that uh, doctoral thesis may have been written to a large extent outside the department, though nominally under department supervision, actually under the leadership of a staff member, but with a very much larger input than ever before of uh, parallel disciplines as a result, in our case, of the urban and or area mix. George, I wonder if we could ask uh, uh, Dick Morrow about the significance of that area studies uh, interdisciplinary encounter. Uh, for an Ed Allman, that is, if I'm recalling correctly by, by his own printed word, uh, it was in the presence of uh, representatives of other disciplines that he found an opportunity for defining to his own satisfac satisfaction what he represented uh, as a geographer. Well, we had very close connections with uh, several other departments. We had a very important program in China, Japan, and the Soviet Union. I suppose, in fact, over the 30 years, uh, maybe half of our graduate students are close to it, have gone through those specialties. Um, an another very important connection to, for all of Garrison's students, especially, was the uh, relationship with the civil engineering, yes. because uh, uh, these and also was our first introduction to large-scale research projects. And most of us were involved in, in uh, highway impact studies, and, uh, which continued to influence us for a long time to come. I think that's very important. Uh, Weaver's ONR project on crop combinations in the Midwest right. was an enormous resource in terms of bringing in graduate students to get them doing something together. You didn't go off and do your thesis. You were actually working with other people on bits and this pieces. This probably was a, a new a change from individual research to group participation. Yeah, and it, it really did result in jobs, uh, I think at one time, probably toward the end of the 50s, half of the planners in the Twin Cities were geographers. If I look back upon it, one of the truly striking differences as before 1950, or to be more exact, before the Second World War, the war was a hiatus in so many ways, was, as Dick Morrill had just stated, a doctoral thesis was a lonely thing. You went out, uh, you did your uh, field study, you did your research, you intercommunicated, you hoped, with the chairman who was directing your thesis, and occasionally, in an informal way, uh, you met people from other disciplines, and you were chronically short of funds. The big difference, which I think is part of the history of this whole thing, is first the very large increase in support. But more than that, the point that you, you have just made, several of you, which is geography discovering and being discovered by outside funds for research support, which certainly was not the case uh, prior to the 1950s. Uh, research support in area studies, research to support in geography studies, qua geography, such as Weaver's crop studies. And that, I think, was true of all the major departments. It was certainly true at Chicago, yes. The impact of that on, mm -hmm. on our attitudes and our values and uh, the speed with which we are working, which, in a sense, I look back upon, is a double-edged weapon. True. It sometimes did retard and slow down your own thesis work, yet it, it gave you possibilities none of us used to dream of. We especially owed a lot, I think, to the Office of Naval Research, 
not only for sponsoring many of these projects, but uh, later on for sponsoring symposia in which people from around the country got together for the first time. And what was the Navy doing in the Midwest? Good Indeed. question. <laughs> Supporting us. Well, again, in a sense, another factor, another word, a cover word we could use was in the 50s, immobility in our profession, which was mobility worldwide. Geographers suddenly found the ways through programs like ONR uh, to go and do a doctoral thesis in some or other remote corners of the world. But I think mobility, as demonstrated, were we to plot the number of people attending divisional meetings of our association, national meetings of our association, mobility within the country, geographers beginning to circulate because we had the means, we had the wherewithal, we had the interest, we were excited, things were happening, and while I agree that our publications were still limited, we were anxious to see what the other fellow was doing. And we were able to move, we could afford to move, which was not the case. Attending meetings was something reserved for the senior faculty. If they were lucky, they would get their fare. And graduate students, if they did, would probably do what uh, by Hank's mayor or whatever means was available. I want to bring up one more thing. I think we tend to talk about names and individuals and this sort of thing. But I think we as graduate students fed each other as much as any of the distinguished faculty did. And I think that was possible because of the expansion of the numbers of people. But I think there was another thing about context, and that is the kind of mobility you just spoke about. It was an enormously mobile society in the Midwest, and the national meetings brought us together also. And I think it was that more than anything else uh, that made you feel that uh, well, you were part of a, a society that was your own age, coming out of the mm -hmm. same background as yourself, and you were not some sort of disciple. Glory. If I could take up this, perhaps a special aspect of the mobility, it seems to me that the decade uh, under examination was one in which uh, Chicago, take that case again, um, which had become accustomed to being a sender, uh, that is a, a point of origin for significant faculty around the U.S. as a whole, uh, became a significant receiver for the first time. I, uh, I think, again, most particularly of Marvin Michael and Brian Berry and Phil Wagner, uh, I brought along um, Phil Wagner's book, The Human Use of the Earth, because of a couple of lines that are in it, uh, in which he speaks, I think, of an experience that must have been occurring in many departments at that time, uh, in which the, a certain disturbance was set up by the encounter uh, of uh, unlike frames of reference. Here's what Phil says. Um, by way of accounting for this book, which, uh, for which I have very considerable uh, admiration. It says, a great inspiration and much of my training are derived from Carl Sauer, Sauer and his colleagues at Berkeley, under whom I did my graduate work. Later, at Chicago, I was confronted with a new and unexpected kind of geography and was stimulated to an attempt to reconcile it with the tradition I follow. That is, he, he held to uh, his convictions, and yet he never was the same. And I think uh, that, there, uh, that he, in turn, stands as something of uh, an exemplar of a, uh, of a phenomenon that was becoming rather widespread. It's another aspect of mobility. In other words, while a European scholar will look upon American universities as far more uh, in flux than the European ones, where appointments are made and usually are lifetime ones, even though they do move from here to there. I think that in our own discipline, the number, as you pointed out, Chicago was one case. Michigan was another, where the majority of the staff came out of two institutions in terms mm -hmm. of their academic training. Yet, if you look back upon it in the 60s, very much more now, it is a very widely varied background uh, as a result of yet another kind, an academic or faculty or staff or and or graduate student mobility, uh, in part, I presume, because of the means available, in part because the university expansion, which uh, that's one point we, uh, Fred referred to it in terms of enrollment. 
it was not perhaps as spectacular at our place as in some others were in to teach psychology introductory course they hired the biggest hall in town hill auditorium with 4500 seats they didn't quite fill it but they filled about half of it in the introductory course but there was this great expansion through the 50s which in itself by sheer numbers as a result of budget as a result of employment possibilities had a very direct impact on all layers from graduate students on up, just about everybody involved, uh, so that it, it was believed that there was no end to it. We know better than that now in retrospect, but it certainly seems so, would you say not at that time, that we were just going to keep going? Yes, not only could we add faculty, but we, as Fred said, enjoy a series of, of visitors. Um, it's interesting that in Washington, we may have been thought of as, as quite narrow in the quantitative area, but in fact, we had a tremendous uh, internal debate on the subject, and we had a series of, uh, of visitors, such as uh, Richard Hartshorn and Preston James and Ron Book, um, even during the, the most extreme years. And uh, though I suppose the most influential person, in, at least in my career, was the visit of Torsten Hagerstrand from Sweden, in 1959, and that, of course, influenced uh, many of us for many years. The other thing was it was an open society, George. I think um, my first publication was with Weaver. I remember Noss and McCarty. I remember Morrill and Garrison. I think that kind of collaboration, although it may be frowned upon as using graduate students, <laughs> was tremendously helpful to us. Uh, mm -hmm. There was no lack. You didn't wait to publish. There was enough going, going on. There was enough demand for this sort of thing. And, of course, the papers we mentioned before, the occasional papers, the discussion yes. papers, and this sort of thing. Thank yeah. God for the Xerox. Yes. The, the uh, uh, function of the staff seminar, uh, where uh, everybody got their shot on an equal basis, and uh, uh, the... Uh, intellectual interchange in those seminars were hot and uh, incredibly heady kinds of experiences. I found those, you know, some of the most exciting times in my life. Ann Buttermer has called this social construction, and I think that's what it is. Yes, I think that we go under that heading. And geography as a whole, uh, we started out by uh, saying that Geography expanded in staff, it expanded in students, it changed emphasis. Uh, perhaps one of the points we might take a look at right now, at this particular turn, is the change in the thrust of the field as against, let us say, the 30s, which is where the comparison would have to be made, uh, the introduction of entirely new aspects techniques, point of view. Uh, there's just one thing I'd like to add. Maybe I made it before, but it always seems to me so important that if you speak of worldwide stimulus, stimulus diffusion in our discipline, this was one of the big things that happened in the last 30 years. Uh, the expansion of these ideas and their gradual adoption by uh, colleagues uh, worldwide, which was certainly not the case before. I'm glad we thought it was new. Now I don't think it was as new. You can go back and you can find uh, calculus of probabilities in the late 19th century. You can find the rank size rule. You can find all of these things. But it was important that we thought it was new when we were opening up the world. This was very important, I think, in that sense of change. In, in the Chicago department, I, I'd say uh, it was new to the, re uh, the previously resident faculty. Uh, if I could develop a, a little further the opening point, that it seems to me that uh, the, the new Chicago department, as seen by the persons themselves of the opening of the 1950s, um, w were truly waiting uh, such that they could follow through on their, on their designs and uh, general intentions. For example, uh, an Alan Philbrick, interestingly, uh, within the walls, was talking about decision making with some enthusiasm, even excitement, and yet it wasn't really resolving into something uh, operational. Uh, similarly, as has so often been said, Robert Plant uh, 
had uh, um, general conceptions pertaining to uh, basic differentiation of regions and uh, organization of settlement systems. But he, I do believe, had reached the limit of his ability to elaborate and to uh, put that to work for research purposes. It wasn't then until the arrival of a Gilbert White, who in turn was indebted to um, certain people in economics, for his ability to put decision-making theory or something approaching that to work, that the Philbrick general orientation was reactivated, uh, leading to a payoff. And uh, then, as to the Robert Plant um, general orientation, I do think it wasn't until Brian Berry's arrival from the Garrison Group that uh, there was a local capability for doing something about it. One of the things that, um, perhaps it's nostalgic, we have uh, spoken of various meetings, the uh, chance to get together people in the field, workers at all levels. One of the things that, um, and I don't believe it survived, but it was active for a while, uh, we are all aware of the famous Chicago or Midwestern field conferences of the 30s, which was one of the creative uh, influences in the development of the field at that time. And for a short while, in the 50s, there was an attempt made for people within a, a subsection of the discipline to get together. We mm -hmm. had it for a while in the late 50s and into the 60s in uh, people interested in quantitative techniques in Michigan, mm -hmm. yeah. state, Wayne, and the University of Michigan. We had it from the late 40s into the later 50s, and that's something I'd like to see revived, in a, a periodic get-together of people interested in maps. Some were cartographers. Some were people who were interested in graphics. In the beginnings, the first time I've heard of computer graphics. Some, like myself, interested <coughs> in the history of map making. We usually got together in Chicago, got together once or twice in Ann Arbor, and it was, a, uh, it was a microcosm of a particular interest group. Now mm. we have it, of course, on a national scale, but I think the, the fragmentation is, is almost too great for me to, to identify with. Then it was a, within the compass of a region, within driving distance of mm -hmm. each other, that we would have these to get together, which again resulted in some publications, some papers, and some very good informal discussions, which in the long run is the one thing we'll all remember. That's what I was calling earlier in the day invisible colleges, uh, I think uh, developed at about that time with uh, oh, exceptional vigor somehow, and uh, apparently on a regional basis. I'm not entirely sure about that. Well, we had the NDA institutes. I mean, remember yeah. Wayne and I? Uh, we had the field work in uh, the Ozarks and out west, Mathers, Salisbury, and myself. I think there were different forms that we did these things in, and they might have been smaller. It wasn't all the profession out in the field as the survey group was in the 30s. It was but a smaller I think it profession. Did, well, that's <laughs> true, yeah. Much. But I think we had it in terms of uh, various types of uh, mechanisms to get this job done. One of the points we had discussed earlier, gentlemen, was the way in which in the 1950s geography as a discipline was beginning to change its position within. This is perhaps widening and putting another lens on our particular camera, a much wider angle one, in the uh, general field of uh, liberal education. And I wonder how you feel about that particular issue, which in retrospect is quite important, looking up at, in, uh, at this time in a, an age of retrenchment, I regret to say. Uh, did you, uh, were you under the impression in the 50s that geography was gaining ground, getting to be more important, getting to be more popular, getting to have a greater <clears throat> impact and a better and a stronger place? Yeah, I think it was called general education at Minnesota more than liberal education, but that's what it was. We expanded in the undergraduate enrollments uh, there were significantly higher proportions, uh, percentages of graduate students, but that was a very small number nevertheless. I think we spread uh, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary out of the war, out of the area studies, then into planning, 
engineering. What we were doing with other disciplines is strikingly different, it seems to me, than what I hear about the 30s and the 20s and the teens. I think geography has influenced its sister disciplines. That's as important as anything it's done to geography itself. Now, you see, there's certain educational... I don't know if there are changes or not, Bill. You can, you can correct me on that. But it seems like a lot of the enrollment, undergraduate enrollment, that uh, came during that time was exactly the time these departments were being, that, that it's, the colleges of liberal arts are putting in core distribution requirements and these sorts yeah. of things, and uh, geography was uh, put in uh, as satisfying parts of those cores, either in the physical sciences or the social sciences or some in some, or maybe both in places, and that a lot of that uh, attraction geography came out of the, out of the purely, uh, uh, sense of, of students that they'd rather take uh, geography as a science and physics, for example, and then we had a we got a we got a clientele then that we could uh, do something okay. with and develop. I think the other disciplines wondered where in the hell we were coming from. Yeah, I do too. Or where, in, where we had been. In a way, uh, what we are now uh, coming to, it seems to me, gentlemen, <clears throat> is what um, the title given to this uh, conversation was to begin with: the changing context. Uh, of uh, geography within the wider framework of the universities. We have not really touched upon an interesting thing which occurs to me, I don't know if you agree with me, and that is that not just for a, the period of a war, such as World War II, when there was a great number of people, practitioners, involved in the defense effort in one way or another, but that after the war and after Korea, in a sense, uh, there was a Perhaps there was a trend to recognize geography in the halls of planning and in the halls of government. This is something I'm not at all sure about myself, but it, in a sense it's part of the context. Do you think that there was a, a greater demand, a greater number of possibilities of employment? I hesitate to say greater influence. Yeah, I think there is, yeah. and there was. This is particularly true of city planning, for example. Yeah which uh, had an incredible explosion in demand for people and uh, relatively few people to take them. And uh, it seemed like uh, that was one of the really rich areas where a number of people who were interested in urban studies went. I don't know what field, like, field work was like in the 20s and 30s, but the development of the tools in the 50s, I think, underlies where we're going now in environment, pollution, Right. Perception. I think that's where we came of age. In a sense, what, uh, what we really see is the projection of the 50s, what we could look at for just one moment, because I don't think we can completely ignore it, though our, our brief was one of retrospection, mm -hmm. uh, that the, <coughs> I think exactly what Fred Lukerman said, the arsenal of research tools such as remote sensing, uh, such as the uh, arsenal of uh, presentation techniques, which is a direct outgrowth, both of uh, the quantitative uh, approach and of a big renaissance, which I think is an interesting thing we haven't touched upon, of map making and presentation ways in American geography. If you look upon the maps, of our predecessors and those of the 50s and the 60s, I think there is a, a very, very substantial qualitative change. Mm. And in a way, uh, that word underlies the whole period, this whole decade. What I wonder is, how do you look now, having concentrated our in attention entirely on one decade, it seems to me uh, justified to say, well, how do we look now upon the following two, since we are almost at the end of the third one. How do we look upon the events, anyway, of the 60s? Have we continued the same uh, trends, the same changes? Have we introduced a new thrust? Or are we still more or less following what happened in what begins to look as a result of this and many other conversations as the one big uh, time of change, the time of the 50s?